most people will agree with me when I say that these syndromes can be quite confusing. The key difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome is that nephrotic syndrome is characterized by an excess amount of protein in the urine, whereas nephritic syndrome is characterized by an excess amount of blood in the urine. The kidneys make urine by filtering the blood. Normally, no protein passes into the urine when the blood is filtered. This is because protein particles in the blood are too large to pass through the tiny holes of the glomerulus. In nephrotic syndrome, the kidney injury is manifested as an increase in permeability of the capillary wall of the glomerulus, allowing too much protein to leak from the blood into the urine. One of the main clinical signs of proteinuria is foamy urine. Excessive protein excretion results in low levels of important proteins in the blood, such as albumin. The liver tries to compensate for this protein loss by increasing the synthesis of albumin, but at the same time, it also releases more cholesterol and triglycerides. The decreased level of albumin also causes fluid to leave the bloodstream and enter the tissues. This causes the kidneys to compensate by retaining even more water and sodium. Ascites or pleural effusion may develop because the fluid accumulates in the abdominal cavity or in the space surrounding the lungs. Swelling of the labia or the scrotum can also occur. Most often, the fluid that causes the tissue swelling is affected by gravity and therefore moves around. During the night, fluid accumulates in the upper parts of the body, such as the eyelids. During the day, when a person is sitting or standing, fluid accumulates in the lower parts of the body, such as the ankles. Typically, periorbital edema is noted first and is often misdiagnosed as an allergy. Apart from albumin, there will also be a loss of proteins that help prevent clotting and antibodies that normally fight infections. This can lead to blood clots and infections. In nephritic syndrome, the glomerular injury is manifested as an inflammation of the glomerulus. About half of the people with acute glomerular nephritis have no symptoms. If symptoms do occur, the first to appear are tissue swelling due to fluid retention, low urine volume, and various degrees of proteinuria and hematuria. The decreased urine output comes from the fact that the kidneys slowly lose their ability to remove waste and fluid from the blood to make urine which in turn may lead to hypertension. Hematuria is the result of the passage of red blood cells through gaps in the glomerulus. So you would expect a urine sediment with red blood cells and proteins, but not to the same level as you would see with nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome can be primary or secondary. The most common primary causes of nephrotic syndrome are focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membranous nephropathy, and minimal change disease. The most common secondary causes include diabetes, amyloidosis, lupus, and certain viral infections such as HIV. A number of drugs that are toxic to the kidneys can also cause nephrotic syndrome, especially anti-inflammatory drugs. Glomerulonephritis, on the other hand, most often occurs as a complication of a throat or skin infection with streptococcus. It typically develops in children between the ages of 2 and 10, some weeks after the recovery from the infection. Other causes of glomerulonephritis include EJA nephropathy, the most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide, and lupus. A subset of glomerulonephritis, known as rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, can present with severe and progressive renal failure. Examples of this include good pastures disease, polyarteritis nodosum, and weakness granulomatosis. The diagnosis is generally made based on a urine and a blood test. A laboratory test of urine collected over a 24-hour period is useful for measuring the degree of protein loss. But the collection of urine over such a long period of time is difficult for many people to accomplish. Alternatively, to estimate protein loss, a single urine specimen can be tested to measure the ratio of the level of protein to that of creatinine. Nephrotic range proteinuria in a 24-hour urine collection is defined as having more than 3.5 grams of protein in the urine. A protein to creatinine ratio of 2 to 3 mg protein per mg creatinine also indicates nephrotic range proteinuria. 
Urinary protein excretion varies widely in glomerulonephritis, but is generally less than 3 grams of protein per day. Patients with glomerulonephritis may also present with macroscopic hematuria, often described as T or cola-colored urine. Microscopic urine examination will reveal red blood cells that are classically dysmorphic as a result of the stress they incur as they pass through the nephron. They are called acantocytes and are indicative of glomerular cause of hematuria. A little side note, a urinary dipstick is not the same as a urinalysis. The urinary dipstick measures protein concentration rather than the rate of protein excretion and therefore cannot be used to make the diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome. However, in most patients with nephrotic syndrome and in some patients with nephritic syndrome, the urinary dipstick will show a high level of albumin. It is therefore often used as a screening test while we wait for the quantitative protein excretion studies. Typical laboratory findings of nephrotic syndrome include low levels of albumin and a high concentration of lipids, sometimes exceeding 10 times that of a normal concentration. In glomerulonephritis, a complete blood cell count is used to determine if the patient is anemic, which may suggest impaired EPO production by the kidneys, and it is also used to estimate the GFR in order to document the degree of renal dysfunction. Additional useful tests depend on the patient's history and physical examination. A chest x-ray may demonstrate pulmonary edema or findings suggestive of Wigner's granulomatosis or Good Pasteur's disease. An echocardiogram may identify pericardial effusion or endocarditis. A renal ultrasound is frequently obtained in case of a decreased GFR in order to evaluate the kidney size. A kidney size of less than 9 cm may suggest extensive renal scarring with a low likelihood of reversibility. A renal biopsy is often used in nephritic syndrome for definitive diagnosis and is helpful in distinguishing between primary and secondary causes. It can also allow rapid diagnosis in cases of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis where prompt diagnosis is essential in preserving renal function. A biopsy can also yield information regarding the level of inflammation, the extent of fibrosis, and the overall prognosis. The first-line treatment for both nephrotic and nephritic syndrome is to treat the underlying cause. In addition, almost all patients are given diuretics to reduce fluid retention and an ACE inhibitor to lower the blood pressure, to prevent worsening of the disease, and to reduce the amount of protein excreted in the urine. General therapy includes a diet that contains low amounts of saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium. When a bacterial infection is suspected as the cause of acute glomerulonephritis, antibiotics are usually ineffective because the disease begins one to six weeks after the infection. Some autoimmune disorders, such as rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and EGA nephropathy, are treated with corticosteroids. And diseases such as Good Pasteur's disease, Wegener's granulomatosis, and certain subtypes of lupus may require treatment with cytotoxic agents such as cyclophosphamide and azathioprine. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to see more of my videos where I explain various medical topics in an easy and understandable way, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button if you want to get notified every time I upload a video.